All right, we're going to start off with, I'm going to do this so I can step away a little bit. So I can't see you very well because the light is kind of bright, but we're going to start off first with full disclosure. In all honesty, who saw my title? Is it up already? Yes. So who saw my title, leaned over to the person sitting next to them and said, doesn't she know that the title of the movie is Back to the Future, not Back from the Future? Who did that? Who thought that? So it was intentionally back from the future. One, I want to avoid copyright issues. But more importantly, it's a trip where I've had a chance to go into the future, see what's happening with scleroderma, and come back and look at the path that got us there. So we're going to take this trip together. All right, I traveled into the future. I can, is there any way? I think I might try and stand this way because I can't see the slides. All right, so. And what I saw is we have the cure. And I am confident that we have the cure in the future. But how did we get there? So we got there by putting the pieces together, the pieces of the scleroderma puzzle together, by doing the research that we've done over the years. Of course, that started, you know, about 20 years ago when I was about three years old. <laughs> I was born with this gift. But really, it started by discoveries that advance our research. And the research that leads to discoveries, if we're fortunate, ultimately leads to treatments or therapies that can be further developed. And that's how we get to the cure in the future. Obviously, it hasn't been a very straight path. You know, not everything comes easy. It's taken a lot of people doing a lot of work to get to the cure. But nevertheless, there is a path to get there. All right, and as you can see, I can even read my own quotes from here. Let's see if I can see which one is up. I may have to ask you to read it to me. Perfect, and this was said by a general in the Union Army during the American Civil War. So how did we prepare to our success? How did we prepare to find the cure? All right, well, we started out by increasing the pace of our research over time. We started out with a small number of scientific publications early on in the research path. Around 1980, we had maybe a couple hundred publications per year. And as we moved on, the number has increased. In 2017 alone, there were over 1,200 scientific publications on scleroderma. So the pace of research is increasing. Um, the amount of research that we're doing is increasing, and the number of discoveries that we are reporting is increasing. Why is that important? Because all these discoveries serve as building blocks. They're building blocks for the next investigator to follow the lead and pursue the research. They're building blocks for our early career investigators to launch their careers, and they provide leads in general for the research community. All right. So, in addition to increasing the pace of research and publications, what we've also had is we've had an increase in the number of clinical trials on scleroderma. So, if you add up clinical trials on systemic scleroderma and localized scleroderma that you can search for in clinicaltrials.gov, just, just doing the search for anything that pops up, there are over 400 trials registered there. That alone is hope that there will be a cure because the likelihood of all 400 succeeding is slim, but the likelihood of having one or two succeeding is high. So, on our path to the future where we see there is a cure, what have we learned? You know what, I am gonna ask for a microphone just because if I can't see any of my slides, it's gonna be really hard to, I'm gonna have to make you read everything. So is there any way I could have one? Or is this detachable? No. Yes. Thank you. Because I'd like to move down and be able to see. That's okay. Thank you. I'm just not tall enough to be able to stretch that far. <laughs> All right. You don't need to see me. You just need to see the slide. So what we have learned is that we've increased the number of discoveries. We've increased the pace of research. 
things that we learned that you might be familiar with, at a minimum, right? Starting as early as the 1970s, we learned that there are cells that we call myofibroblasts that grow in all tissues, all organs that are responsible for the increased collagen production, for more extracellular matrix that causes the thickening and the fibrosis in the skin of internal organs. That's when they were discovered. We these fibroblasts from the skin of scleroderma patients. We generated the first animal model that we use for, to study scleroderma in the research laboratories. We started using ACE inhibitors for scleroderma renal crisis, which used to be the number one cause of death of patients and no longer is as a result of that. We developed the Rodnan skin score, which is a way, I, for those of you who have had it done, your physician pinches your skin in different sites and comes up with a score as to how much skin involvement you have. That allows your physician to assess the progression of your skin involvement, but also for the clinical trials, that's how you monitor if people are improving or not on the drug that's being tested. We have looked, we have identified a classification criteria. As you know, scleroderma is very heterogeneous and no two patients are alike. But now we have these criteria that help us subset patients so we can look at them in these little groups of slightly more homogeneous subsets. We have learned to do nail fold capillary microscopy to look at the little vessels in your nail bed. We have identified antibodies that we know are unique to scleroderma patients in their blood. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. We tweaked the classification of scleroderma. We started treating pulmonary arterial hypertension with epoprostenol. And we started identifying predictors of survival in patients. We also did the first study of twins where we saw that scleroderma is not a purely inherited disease because concordance or the presence of scleroderma in both individuals and a twin pair was really low in the twins. We did the first high throughput gene expression study, which is when you can look, take cells from a patient, cells from a control individual, and you look at every possible gene, thousands of them in the cell, and know which ones are turned on, which ones are turned off. We completed the very first scleroderma lung study. There's been another one since then and a third one underway, and that one determined that cyclophosphamide might be effective, at least for some patients. <clears throat> Now it's bright. Now I can see you, you can see me, and I can read. Um, we did the first genome-wide association study that showed that there are hot spots in our DNA that may make us more prone or more susceptible to scleroderma. We also had new classification. We reported the results of the very first stem cell transplant trial, uh, tested mycophenolate in the scleroderma lung study too, and compare genes that are turned on and off now in scleroderma lung, since lung is one of the leading problems in scleroderma patients right now, and how they compare to other lung diseases. These are just examples of the numerous discoveries that were made over the past few decades on scleroderma, and especially over the past two decades. So we have made progress. And these are specific examples of the kind of progress we made. We have learned that patients with the diffuse skin involvement are different from those with the limited skin involvement, both systemic, obviously. We know that, um, let me see if the laser pointer will work. It's kind of weak, you can't see it. But we know from the pink line that patients with diffuse skin involvement have involvement or progression of their skin thickening that goes up really quickly, really early, but then plateaus. And we learned that patients with the more limited skin involvement in the turquoise line have a very slight increase in their progression over time. We also now know when, if, if and only if, someone's gonna have internal organ complications, when are they likely to have it along that path? We learned about the nine scleroderma autoantibodies. How many of you know what your autoantibodies are? That's pretty good. So now we know that there are nine scleroderma-associated antibodies. Those are the nine. We know some of them, like RNA polymerase three, are more common in patients with diffuse skin involvement. And we know that others, like anti-centromere, are more common in patients with limited skin involvement. We've also learned that depending on which autoantibody you have, we can 
estimate your risk for developing certain inter internal organ involvement. Does not mean you will develop it, it just says that it is more likely that patients with this antibody, they are at higher risk for ILD or pulmonary hypertension or cardiomyopathy. So we've learned a lot. We've learned that our environmental triggers of scleroderma or scleroderma-like illnesses, there are case reports of exposures to things such as silica dust, vinyl chloride, trichloroethylene, some resins, formaldehyde, that put people at increased risk for developing scleroderma or scleroderma-like illness. Closeness to airports by Heathrow Airport, for a while there by uh, Boston Logan Airport, um, diesel exhaust, some of the drugs that now we use like bleomycin, especially to cause scleroderma experimentally in the mice in the lab so we can study them. Obviously, we don't use cocaine to cause experimental scleroderma. That would be just too appealing for people to start working in the lab. Uh, but we do use bleomycin. And, you know, there has been a link to ingestion of things such as appetite suppressants, toxic oil, and tryptophan with scleroderma-like illnesses or things such as pulmonary hypertension. So we've learned that there's the possibility of having these environmental exposures. Obviously, not everybody exposed to them gets scleroderma or similar illnesses, right? And not everybody who has scleroderma has been exposed to these things. That's what has made this a complex disease that is very challenging to study. All right, what else have we learned? We have learned that there are a lot of cells that have abnormal function in scleroderma. We mentioned the fibroblasts or the myofibroblasts. We know there are other cells that are also misbehaving in scleroderma. Cells of the immune system, such as what we call T lymphocytes, the B lymphocytes and plasma cells that make the autoantibodies we talked about. Um, other cells, endothelial cells in the blood vessels that get injured, that, that are involved in the vascular damage. So we've learned what is happening with each of these cell types, how they are misbehaving, and what are they producing that is contributing to scleroderma. We learned that cells are not always what they seem to be. There's what's called this plasticity in the cells, that sometimes one cell type can change into another one, what we call a transition from one cell type to another one. So we know, for example, that there are different kinds of cells that can lead to the formation of a myofibroblast. So different cells can transition into this phenotype that can cause extra collagen and other matrix protein production. We've learned that the myofibroblasts themselves can make a lot of products. They secrete, they produce a lot of growth factors, cytokines, other products that we know can cause inflammation, that we know can cause fibrosis. But we also know that the body has a way to try and develop means to heal itself. So we know that these cells can also make things, they can produce things that can block or reverse their activation or fibrosis. And it's harnessing this information that we've learned that helps us decide, okay, what do we need to decrease? What do we need to increase to make the cells get balanced again? So it's this balance of things that trigger fibrosis, things that block fibrosis, and things that we can generate in the lab to have either effect that allows us to understand this complex, basically, interaction that's in scleroderma. So it's not really a single target that we can go after. It will be difficult to shut down the function of one gene or one protein and come up with a cure because this is not a very simple condition. There are many cells and many factors at play, and being able to change the levels of the key players is going to be critical for us to come up with the cure. All right, so when we tip this balance in favor of the factors that cause fibrosis, we get fibrosis, and when we can reverse that balance, then we can adjust and reverse the fibrosis. We learned that the collagen that is made in excess along with other proteins made in excess, like fibronectin, like other extracellular matrix protein, which initially we thought just go outside the cell into what we call the matrix of the tissue, such as in the skin and the dermis, and they link to each other and they stiffen and they just stay there, and we thought that that's all they did. But now we know that they act as a sink 
for growth factors and molecules that signal back to the cells to activate them and turn them on. We also now know that they get broken down. When they're broken down, some of their fragments can also signal to the cells to either turn them on or turn them off. So not a very simple picture. But still, we figured all that out. We went after the lung tissues. You know, lung disease is an important complication of scleroderma, and we wanted to understand what is unique to scleroderma lung. How does it compare to other conditions that are related, like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? How does someone with scleroderma and pulmonary arterial hypertension, how do their lung tissues and the molecules in their lung tissues compare to those with the idiopathic pulmonary hypertension? The phenotypes are the same, but at the molecular level, and then thousands of genes that are turned on or turned off, what we call the molecular fingerprint. What is similar? What is different? And what we learned is there's plenty of similarities, but there's also a lot of differences. We learned that scleroderma lung disease in patients who have pulmonary fibrosis have similarities with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. We also learned that those with pulmonary hypertension have similar similarities with idiopathic pulmonary hypertension. But we also learned that each illness, each lung tissue has its own unique molecular fingerprint. And that's important because you want to know that if you're developing a therapy for pulmonary fibrosis, is it going to be effective across all the diseases that are related? Or is it going to be effective against just a particular one? We learned a lot about genes and the environment. So it's somewhat of a coincidence that I had twins, but I also did the one twin study that was done in scleroderma, where we recruited twins from all over the country, where one or both members of a twin pair had scleroderma. And what we learned from the twin study is concordance for scleroderma. So the number of twins where both have scleroderma that concordance rate was really low, it was 4 to 5%. So that told us that this is not a purely inherited disease, right? This is something that occurs as a result of multiple factors. It's multifactorial, and it is likely that environmental changes, and that could be changes that we're going to talk about that can happen to the DNA, or it could be environmental triggers might play a more important role. And the reason we know that is because when you have identical twins, if you have a, a condition that is purely inherited due to a genetic mutation, then you expect both of them to have it because they're inheriting the same DNA, right? And that is not the case in scleroderma. So that's what that shows. We also conducted genetic studies. So this is where you look at the entire DNA sequence in the cells of the patients, and you see what are changes, especially changes in a single base that may change a little bit how a gene functions or what the protein from that gene looks like. And the results of those studies look like this. That's what's called the Manhattan plot. And basically, it just tells you that where are the hot spots in the DNA where you identify changes that are more frequently found in patients with scleroderma compared to thousands and thousands of otherwise healthy controls. So we've identified a lot of hotspots in scleroderma, some that have been identified in other related conditions, such as lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, and some that have not. This is just a list, an example of the hotspots that were found and the genes that were found. So again, showing you how complex the picture is. So, However, since we know it's not inherited, it doesn't occur in identical twins very often, we know there has to be more to it than the DNA you inherit from your parents. And what's become apparent is there are changes to the DNA that can happen that we call epigenetic changes. These are changes that happen on top of your DNA that can be altered due to diet, they can be altered with smoking, they can be altered with environmental exposure, that we now know, having studied them in the twins, that can be present in one twin and not another. So these are changes that are on top of the DNA sequence you inherit from your parents. So that's what we're looking at right now, with these changes that affect the DNA and can affect the function of the genes. 
So what has that told us in general? That has allowed us to develop this model that says that we are probably born with a genetic background or genes we inherit from our parents that make us more prone to getting scleroderma, more susceptible to getting scleroderma. And there are events that happen along the path, n number one, two, three, four, five, that on that susceptible background, depending on what the events are and what their timing is, determine whether you get scleroderma or lupus or thyroiditis or other related condition. Because we now know that these conditions happen in families where there are scleroderma patients and lupus patients within the family. So what those events are and the sequence of those events is what we're trying to focus on identifying. So what is the good news along the path? Lots of good news. We've learned a lot, right? We've learned a lot along the way. All these pieces are necessary because we're not just going to stumble on a cure without having a lot of information to appreciate when we stumble on it what it is. Um, but the good news is there are a lot of molecules being developed as potential therapies for scleroderma. So in addition to the more than 400 clinical trials that are registered in clinicaltrials.gov, there are dozens and dozens of molecules at various stages of development. Some are still under the discovery phase, being tested in laboratories across the country on cells in animal models. Some have moved forward for further development, toxicity study, pharmacokinetic studies, biodistribution, and some are getting close to going into clinical trials. So we have a lot of potential targets that are being worked on across the world that hold promise that there will be a cure, that one of these molecules that is being investigated will eventually be the cure. So that also leads us to know that scleroderma is a complex disease. It's not one of those straightforward monogenic diseases where you know there's a mutation in this gene and that's it, that's the answer. It's more complex than that, which has made it more challenging to study, more interesting, obviously we are interesting, but also more challenging to study. But still, it's very important for us to continue our research for a lot of reasons. One, it's important for us to find the cure, but also because the answers that we find for scleroderma are likely to benefit other patients with other related conditions. One of the hallmarks of scleroderma is fibrosis or thickening of the skin and inter internal organs. Well, fibrosis can happen in nearly every organ and it can happen in other conditions that I'm going to show you an example of what they are. And actually, fibrosis in the developed world is responsible for nearly half of the deaths. And you may tell me, how could that be? You know, isn't cancer the number one or heart disease? And the answer is, the reason for that is because all these diseases that you hear about every single day, their end result is fibrosis. Liver fibrosis, liver cirrhosis, whether it's alcoholic, whether due to hepatitis infection, whether it's autoimmune, or whatever the trigger is, is liver fibrosis at the end, right? Heart conditions, congestive heart failure, endomyocardial fibrosis, myocardial infarction or heart attack, the scar, that's fibrosis. Kidney fibrosis in diabetics, kidney fibrosis in patients with lupus, that's fibrosis. So you can see whether it's in the eye, in the lungs, asthma. Asthma is fibrosis around the airways. How common is asthma? So being able to solve the scleroderma puzzle, and especially the fibrosis that we see in scleroderma, is likely to have much broader impact. It's likely to be able to be of benefit to other patients with other related diseases. So how did we get to the future, to the cure? Obviously, we continue to do research, and the Scleroderma Foundation is one of the major organizations supporting research. We have been training, um, and let me tell you about the research program, obviously with the vision of Marie and Walter Coyle, who are the founders. Um, we have several grants that we give out, and I am very, very proud to say that the Scleroderma Foundation 
has one of the best respected and very well known, very rigorous and very unbiased peer review process for ensuring that it is the best science that gets funded. We give out grants for established investigators. Um, we give out grants for new investigators. We've given out large called SCORE grants that are grants to encourage collaborations across multiple centers and the open exchange of ideas and the sharing of research. And we are hoping to launch a student award to further nurture the younger generation and ensure that there is a pipeline of future investigators and future researchers. So how does that work? Usually middle of September is our deadline. We get grants. They get assigned to a scientific review panel, peers, world-renowned experts in scleroderma, who will review the grants and score them based on scientific merit. We then rank the grants based on that and award, announce the awardees based on how much funding we have each year. So this is what our data looks like. Over the years, we have given a large number of grants the bars that you see is the number of grants given out each year. And then the line in the gray color is how much money we've given out each year. So the red arrow points to the year when the United Scleroderma Foundation and the Scleroderma Federation came together to form the Scleroderma Foundation and started funding grants jointly. The green arrow points to the year when we started giving out the multi-center score grants to encourage collaborations across centers. So you can tell the amount went up then. But basically, these are the faces of the people we have funded. This slide has more of the early career investigators, those we are mentoring to ensure there's future pipeline of researchers, but I think you can all recognize faces in the R awardees. Many of the world-renowned experts that you all know on this slide had their start with the Scleroderma Foundation grant that launched their career in Scleroderma. So our hope is not only to train the next generation, our hope is to also sustain the established senior investigators and not lose them because the funding climate is so challenging. So we have given out 252 grants to date through 2018 and greater than $26 million just by the Scleroderma Foundation. I think that's a huge accomplishment. Our path to the cure involves training the next generation and training the next generation should start early at any stage. We encourage people to come to our labs from high school students to undergraduate students to start learning what research is like to get excited about research on scleroderma. We had the last day and a half, all day yesterday and today, an early career mentoring workshop where some of our senior experts spend a day and a half with investigators who are early in their career, and it's a mentoring workshop to make sure that they have the tools, the resources, and the knowledge to succeed, and so that we can also retain them as doing scleroderma research. And I know some of the early career investigators are still here. Some of them presented posters today. Can you all stand, please, early career investigators? And ultimately, the path to the, cure, to, 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 to the cure in the future will involve the mentoring and ensuring the pipeline, but it also requires all of us to be engaged. We want to increase the resources that are available. We want to increase the funding that we can do. Because when you increase the resources, you can increase the pace of research. We can get to the cure faster because research is expensive and it takes resources to do it. So we all have a role to play. The donors who can support the research, the investigators who do the research, the patients who participate in the research by giving blood, by giving a skin punch biopsy, by participating in the clinical trials. And obviously these are not mutually exclusive because we can all promote awareness and we can all serve as donors. All right, so hopefully with this I have shown you that finding a cure for scleroderma is not a mission impossible. I was in the future, I saw it, and I came back to tell you about it. And I wanna 
sit, we were recently in Washington, D.C. at the Air and Space Museum, and this quote by Robert Goddard, who was an engineer and a physicist who actually designed rockets, said, it is difficult to say what is impossible, for the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. So with that, I will end with one of the most famous scleroderma patients, the artist Paul Clay. And a quote from Mary Woodard Lasker, who was an advocate for research. Thanks to her, the budget of NIH increased tremendously during her advocacy days, who said, if you think research is expensive, try disease. So I hope that I have taken you with me on this path to show you why I'm convinced we will get to the cure. Sampling of the discoveries we've made and the information that we have learned that allows me to say that we will get there and to give you hope that it might not take as long as we think, certainly if we can accelerate the pace of research.